Well, this is certainly an unexpected honor. First things first, I'll say right up front that while I will indeed be discussing the film's heavily rumored surprise ending, I'll put the spoiler warning up before I do. Otherwise, here we go. Now, we all heard the rumors, obviously, that the Nintendo Corporation had intended to follow other IP owners like Marvel Comics and Hasbro in starting film studios to produce movies based on their own properties. But who knew they were already so far along in production? Or that they'd choose me as the first critic to report on their inaugural project, a big-budget reboot of Super Mario Brothers. The film was shown to me at an undisclosed secure facility which I believe to have been somewhere on the border of the outermost region of Mongolia. In order to keep costs and unauthorized photography to a minimum, almost the entirety of this film has been shot on green screens, and while the rough editing had been completed, most of the effects were still in a very early state. Though from what I could gather, the reported $450 million budget, making this the most expensive film since Avatar, is being employed towards some impressive sounding set pieces, but the story could seem to use some further work. This new reimagining of the popular game franchise seeks to eliminate elements from the Mario Brothers mythology deemed too cartoony or out there for a mature mainstream audience. Writing and directing chores have fallen to an enigmatic figure named Wami Tissot, whose pitch reel is said to have wowed executive producer Michael Bay, despite Mr. Tissot seeming to have appeared out of thin air, his IMDb filmography consisting exclusively of an otherwise blank page and the words, Not the Room. Actor Mike the Situation, best known for the series Jersey Shore, makes his debut as Mario, while SNL alumni Chris Kattan triumphantly returns to the screen as older brother Luigi. The story opens with a flashback in which Mario, then a Brooklyn construction worker, fails to rescue his girlfriend Pauline from Dwayne The Rock Johnson, taking up a rare villainous role as Hawaiian mob kingpin Don Kong. With Pauline dead, Mario falls into an alcoholic depression, which only ceases when his estranged brother re-enters his life with a scheme to restart their late father's defunct Bensonhurst plumbing business. Gary Oldman has a turn as their landlord, Mr. Sagali. <laughs> Cute. While this certainly takes certain liberties with Shigeru Miyamoto's original characters, it effectively establishes that this is a fresh, hip, dark, and gritty Mario in the tradition of J.J. Abrams' Star Trek reboot and Christopher Nolan's Batman. The film makes what I think was intended as a subtle reference to this change in a scene where Mario and Luigi watch The Dark Knight on Blu-ray, commenting on how awesome it is and how lame Batman used to be otherwise. Miyamoto himself, incidentally, seems to have given his blessing by appearing in a hilarious cameo as one Stanley the Bugman. Anyway, through a series of plot complications, the brothers find themselves on the Mushroom Kingdom, here reimagined as a small independent island nation off the coast of Nova Scotia, and conscripted into battle against a terrorist organization of yet unclear origin or motive, cleverly named the Shy Guys. While many have already questioned the casting of pop sensation Keisha in the role of Princess Peach, it must be said she has a certain presence, though it's hard to ignore the fact that she seems mostly on hand to set off a full half of the film's twelve musical dance sequences. Oh, and no prizes for guessing which previously glimpsed character turns out to be the Shy Guy mastermind. This being a stridently real-world reimagining of the Mario universe, fans looking for familiar elements like power-ups or magic weapons will be sorely disappointed. Luigi does kick off a particularly gonzo psychedelic musical sequence by eating a mushroom, though, while Mario is never far from his lucky sledgehammer, which he nicknames Old Tanuki. Most disappointing of all for longtime fans will be the total lack of the game series' most popular villains, the Koopas, though a running subplot about genetically engineered tortoises seems to heavily hint at them, as does a mysterious scene at the end where Oldman Mr. Sagali reappears to hand the brothers a calling card bearing the enigmatic phrase, sequel tease suckers. Whatever that means is anyone's guess. All in all, I'd say the film is quite a departure, but it may hold promise once the effects have been finalized. Set effects, by the way, will be enhanced by the film's groundbreaking 5D visual technology, which requires the purchase of two sets of image-enhancing glasses worn one over the other and an additional $30 upcharge on all tickets. Overall, call me cautiously optimistic on this one. Okay, so let's talk about that other thing. Major spoiler warning from here on out, guys. And here we go. As everyone with an internet connection and no love of surprises already learned months ago, there is indeed a secret bonus scene at the end of the credits. When Mario and Luigi return home, they find their shop to have been infiltrated by none other than Samuel L. Jackson, who identifies himself as a government agent codenamed Master Hand, and indicates that he needs to talk to them about something he calls the Smash Brothers Initiative. Whatever that means is, again, anyone's guess, though some have speculated that it's intended to kickstart an interfilm continuity with Nintendo Pictures' other recently announced projects, including The Legend of Zelda, Kid Icarus, Tyler Perry's Medea Goes to Dreamland, and the much-hyped Vin Diesel vehicle F to the Zero, all of which are expected to be post-converted into 5D and or the highest level of D available at the time of release. 
And now we know why the Oscars were in such a hurry to increase the Best Picture field to a full 50 nominee spots for next year, huh? Sounds like we're in for quite a ride. See you next time! I don't know if it's possible to convey to gamers whose memories don't go back that far just how massive the return of console gaming was to the American popular psyche. Even without an internet to spread the word, the culture of video games caught on like wildfire. And the Super Mario Brothers, the iconic mascots of the monolithically omnipresent Nintendo Entertainment System, went from being unknowns to being as big and then bigger than Mickey Mouse in what was then considered lightning speed. There were Mario toys, Mario cereal, Mario everything. And then in 1989, there was a TV series. Hey, paisanos, it's the Super Mario Brothers Super Show! In a way, it was a wholly natural progression, partially because it was inevitable that the greatest franchise in the history of the medium would quickly become too big to fit in only one medium, but also because... TV is weird! Now, this particular era of American gaming shows takes a lot of abuse, much of it well-deserved. You won't catch me pretending that the power team was any good or that Captain N didn't age horribly. And my biggest Mario-related fantasy, okay, second biggest, is still to see Oogtar from the Mario World cartoon club to death with a pipe wrench. But going back over it, I maintain that even without the aid of nostalgia, Super Show actually holds up, at least as well as it ever held up. It's a quintessential late 80s kitsch piece, pretty much, you know what, I'll just let it speak for itself. You're in for a treat, so hang on to your seat. Get ready for adventure and remarkable weeks. You'll meet the Koopas and Troopas, the Princess and the others. Hanging with the plumbers, you'll be hooked on the brothers to the bridge. Yeah, like that. Produced for two seasons, starting in 1989 by Kitty TV powerhouse Deke, like a lot of U.S. gaming shows that were based on material from Japanese developers, the showrunners weren't actually given much background to work with outside of what could be gleaned from the games themselves, which at this time only included Super Mario Bros. and the U.S. version of Super Mario Bros. 2, which led to some interesting discrepancies. Legend has it that the character designers couldn't really reconcile using Super Mario Bros. 1's Bowser or Super Mario Bros. 2's Wart for the villains, so they split the difference, airing on the Bowser side with a combo character they dubbed King Koopa. Mario and Luigi wear red and green overalls over matching blue shirts instead of the other way around, and Princess Peach is a redhead like her original sprite and is only ever referred to as Princess Toadstool. The cartoon's backstory was rooted mostly in the non-canonical origin story that had been loosely assigned to most English versions of the game in that era. The Mario Brothers are plumbers from Brooklyn magically warped to the Mushroom Kingdom. In most episodes, the four good guys would travel to different worlds that had been conquered by Koopa and his minions, typically built around broad parodies of movie genres, famous stories, or historical periods, though sometimes it got kinda clever. During an adventure in a world inspired by the post-apocalyptic Mad Max movies, Toad finally snapped and went hardcore as the Toad Warrior. The cartoons, however, were only half of the show. Each episode was bookended by a framing story featuring the first-ever live incarnations of Mario and Luigi, played by WWF superstar Captain Lou Albano and actor Danny Wells, respectively. These segments, apparently taking place before the brothers' displacement to the Mushroom Kingdom, were really, really surreal, even by the standards of late 80s kids' TV. The brothers lived in a chaotic plumbing shop, best described as a blue-collar New York version of Pee-wee's Playhouse, complete with strange creatures, wacky gadgets, and a C-list celebrity guest list of people like Sergeant Slaughter, Ernie Hudson doing a Ghostbusters spoof, and even a live-action Inspector Gadget played by Maurice LaMarche. Every week, Monday through Thursday, the live-action brothers would goof off with their guest star while the animated guys fought the good fight. But then on Friday, you'd get a special treat, kicking off the weekend with a Zelda cartoon. Once again, I'll let it speak for itself. <laughs> The Triforce of Wisdom, Link. The evil wizard Ganon has the Triforce of Power. <laughs> Whoever gets both Triforces will rule this land forever. You must help me, Link. Oh, hell yes. Orchestral arrangement of the original Zelda theme, weapons and monsters and sound effects from the games, still my favorite visual depiction of Ganon. If you'd come up through what were then the only two Zelda titles, this was awesome. This is what you wanted to see. This was... Hey! Excuse me, princess! Ah, 
All right, here's the thing. In the 80s, there was this comedy show called Moonlighting about a male-female detective duo that hated but also kind of wanted to sleep with one another. It was a huge hit, even though today people only remember it for being Bruce Willis's big show before Die Hard and for a really funny takeoff on the taming of the shrew they did in one episode. That particular love-hate chemistry was aped by everything for a while there, and the Zelda cartoon is doing another very self-conscious takeoff on it. And yeah, the catchphrase is annoying as hell, but taken on its own merits, the majority of the show was really fun. It's a pretty clever subversion of the usual fantasy dynamic to have the whole thing take place after whatever the big quest was, and now the hero and the princess are basically just these roommates with nothing in common who annoy the hell out of each other in order to avoid the obvious sexual tension. Also, it has to be said, this was easily the most capable and self-reliant Princess Zelda we've ever seen. The majority of the full episodes, including the live-action segments, were collected on a pair of DVD box sets, while the Zelda cartoon got its own DVD that actually came out first, because, you know, Zelda. If nothing else, the Super Show is a perfect time capsule of video game fandom in its nascent state, and well worth checking out even if only as a landmark for the medium's evolution. Of course, you know, there was another Mario cartoon before this one. Super Mario Bros. Peachy Mei Kaioshutsu Daisakusen, roughly translated as Super Mario Bros. The Great Mission to Rescue Princess Peach, was an anime feature film from Toei released in Japan in 1986, and it is crazy rare. After its theatrical run, it was only released on Japanese VHS once, has never been available on any other format, and was never translated into languages other than Japanese or officially distributed outside of Japan. To this day, it remains one of the long-lost holy grails among anime fans, gamers, and Mario collectors alike. The first Mario adaptation ever. So now that you know that this exists, the burning question is, is it any good? The answer? It's okay. I don't want to undersell it, it's a perfectly serviceable kitty anime of the era and about what you'd expect, but like a lot of legendary lost movies, your imagination tends to set up unreasonable expectations. What it does offer is a uniquely fascinating glimpse at the Mario Brothers franchise in the earliest moments of its transformation from video game to pop culture mass media juggernaut. This was the first try at fleshing out a story and characters from the Mario mythology back when that mythology was only this one game, and in many respects it paints a vastly different picture than what we've since grown used to. For example, Mario and Luigi are not plumbers in this. No, really. Instead, they run a grocery store. Yeah. Alright, let's get into it. In the story, Mario is staying up late to play video games. Hey, come to think of it, isn't it funny that this is the only time that Mario, the mascot of a company that exclusively makes video games, has been portrayed as a gamer himself? Anyway, the game opens up a portal to the Mushroom Kingdom, and out comes Princess Peach. Yeah, you wish, buddy. Pursued by Bowser's entourage, and then Bowser himself. <coughs> The Koopa King kicks Mario's ass and makes off with the princess, but not before she drops off a magic pendant and begs Mario to save her. Luigi thinks it's all a dream, but he changes his tune when he sees Peach's pendant, not because he wants to be a hero, but because this version of Luigi is a greedy, treasure-hunting bastard, and he figures there must be more where that came from. The decision gets made for them when the pendant is grabbed by a small blue dog. Eh, not exactly. This is Kibidango, and as neither Yoshi or Toad had been invented yet, he's our cute animal sidekick, and you will be really sick of him by the time this is over. They chase Kibidango into a pipe, which warps them to the Mushroom Kingdom, where a wizard fills them in on the plot you remember from the game. Bowser's forces have taken over the kingdom and turned the Mushroom People into rocks and coins and whatever, Mario and Luigi have to go on a quest for three magic weapons and save Peach before Bowser forces her into marriage and officially becomes king. From there on, it's pretty much exactly what you'd imagine a mid-80s Mario anime from Toei would look like. Mario and Luigi and Kibidango have slapstick encounters with various creatures and obstacles from the game. Meanwhile, Bowser tries unsuccessfully to convince Peach that the whole forced marriage thing won't be so bad. <laughs> Here's a weird scene. When they get the mushroom and restore some of the citizens to normal, check this mushroom lady out. Going by the outfit, it looks like she's supposed to be the movie version of the nameless guys you saved in the first seven castles. So, this is Toad version 1.0. Remember, Toad himself wasn't an official separate character until they needed a fourth player sprite for the American Mario 2. And here's Mario, dreaming of all the G-rated action he'll be getting when they save the day. <laughs> And here's an airship, or rather, a regular ship that they make fly by blowing on it really hard. Okay. In the end, well, what do you think happens? Storm the castle, brave the traps, Mario takes Bowser on hand-to-hand -hand and dispatches him Super Mario 64 style. <laughs> P. 
peace returns to the land, and our heroes step up for their accolades and rewards. But when Peach gets her pendant back, something funny starts happening with Kibidongo. Yeah, this is going exactly where you think it is. Kibidungo is actually Prince Haru, heir to the throne of the Flower Kingdom and transformed by Bowser's magic. And he's Peach's fiancé. Mario takes this about like you'd expect, but he and Luigi say their goodbyes and head back home. And yeah, that's actually how this ends. Sayonara! Mario! Luigi! Genki da na! What the f***? The Mario Brothers busted their asses doing all the work, and this dude we've never heard of, who just hung around the whole time, winds up with the girl. They don't even get a cake this time. They get nothing. The first Mario movie ever ends with Super Mario walking home with Super Blue Balls. And yeah, that's more or less the lost Mario anime. Watching it now, it's not hard to understand how it got lost. Aside from featuring characters who'd eventually be world famous, it's not very distinguishable from other quickly produced cash-in anime features from the same era, and the characters and scenario are pretty far off from where Nintendo would eventually take them. But, as far as relics from gaming's long, hard climb into the popular culture go, I've seen worse. I've definitely seen worse. I'm Bob, and that's The Big Picture. Hello folks, welcome to the show. I'm the Game Overthinker. This is my intern, Ivan. Ivan, say hello to the nice people. If you say my name backwards, it's a reference to something. You know, this is the 73rd episode of the Game Overthinker, but it's also the first one in a while that isn't carrying the weight or baggage of previous episodes built on top of it. So I thought this would be a good opportunity to step back in and introduce new viewers to the way we do things around here. Ivan, would you care to elaborate on that? You typically waste everyone's time with a minute or two of shtick before the opening credits, usually in reference to some long-form parody sketch you're carrying on in the margins of the series. Perhaps you could elaborate a little further for the nice people? Sure. Although your primary function is to provide commentary on games and game culture, about a year ago you were attacked by the Anti-Thinker, your evil double from an alternate universe. You defeated him, but the battle ripped a hole in the space-time continuum, allowing creatures and powers from the video game world to cross over into the human world. Since then, you've been conscripted by Police Commissioner Bunnyface... It's Bonifacio. ...to track and dispatch rogue video game creatures. Amid this, you subsequently fought and destroyed two elementally powered ninjas, Pyrothinker and Cryothinker, only to learn that their initial rampage against arcades and game stores had inadvertently released your 1980s counterpart Retrothinker from cryogenic sleep. An evil force yet unknown to us somehow manipulated Retrothinker's time displacement depression and transformed him into the undead lord of video zombies, the Necrothinker, who you fought, defeated, and finally restored to human form in our most recent episode. And that brings us up to speed? You also took three magic stones representing the elements of fire, water, and earth from the two ninjas and Necrothinker, respectively. Anything else? Our senator is a ninja named Jack Lieberson, who you once supported in a public service ad. Anything else? No, that's pretty much it. So, we have no pressing business now, correct? Correct. And thus, what should we be doing now? Starting the actual show, sir. Well, alright. Cue the opening credits. video game commentator here and a film critic elsewhere, I get asked the following question a lot. Why are there no good video game movies? I also get asked, when will there be good video game movies? How do you make good video game movies? How would you make a good video game movie? Well, let's dig into that. 
Well, the first thing to remember is that good is a subjective term. I mean, some people will tell you that several pretty good video game movies have already been made, and I'd be more or less in that camp. The bigger problem is, and I really hate saying this, but I'm sorry, in a lot of cases making a good movie out of certain games would also probably mean making a movie that really wouldn't give gamers what many of them are looking for. The fact is, unless we're talking about some kind of high concept mood piece, good movies come from good scripts, and those good scripts come from good stories, and most video games don't have those. Now, that's not to say that all game stories are bad, but almost all of them are ill-suited in their unmolested form to movie-making, and even then, the best you can objectively say about them is that, hey, that was a pretty good story, dot dot dot, for a video game. This is why I think the Prince of Persia movie actually does represent kind of a high watermark for these things. Yeah, the movie was just a slick, kinda empty-headed Douglas Fairbanks ripoff, and really, that's all the Prince of Persia titles ever were on a story level. Ditto why I'm not all bent out of shape that the Resident Evil movies are just slicked-up, B-grade zombie junk. I mean, no shit, it's Resident Evil. But those are recent games, made in an era when video games were expected to have at least the fig leaf of a complete narrative. A lot of gaming's most popular and enduring franchises come from the so-called Golden Age, when a video game's story was really more of a setup or suggestion than a full-blown arcing narrative. I mean, let's be frank about this. A proper Legend of Zelda movie is almost certainly a bigger box office draw on multiple levels than, say, a proper Heavy Rain movie. But you're gonna have to work a lot harder to hammer a movie-ready plot out of Zelda, which is always much more about the dungeon exploring and item management gameplay than it is about the story structure. What I'm getting at is, in order to make a good video game movie, sometimes you may end up having to toss out some of what people consider the main parts of the game. This may result in an overall better movie, but it may also leave fans of a certain game feeling that they've been let down by not seeing some of the things that they most liked about the game visualized in live action, which in many cases is the reason they wanted to see a movie in the first place. For example, Ubisoft is producing an Assassin's Creed movie. Now, I think this is a good idea. I don't necessarily love the entire Assassin's Creed series, but it's a good foundation. And it actually has a pretty interesting premise story-wise. But for a movie, I see lots of problems, starting with the very thing that makes Assassin's Creed more than just an open-world period action game. The whole framing device with Desmond is cool in the games because it's obviously building to some kind of important revelation and character development for him, and it allows the game to explain away the more video game-ish aspect of its time progression and mission system. In a movie, on the other hand, that's going to cause all kinds of narrative problems. As cool as you can make the action scenes for Altair or Ezio or whichever guy they end up using, a passive movie audience lacking the player avatar connection to them might find their stories lacking emotional connection or all-important story tension by virtue of the whole thing being a simulation. You could mitigate that somewhat by having the same actor play Desmond and the Assassin, but then you're heading into Walter Mitty territory, and I'm not sure that's where Assassin Creed fans want the movie to go. Or you could just leave Desmond's story out, which a lot of people ask anyway, but then aren't you just kind of making a tackier ninja version of Kingdom of Heaven? And did you hear that there already is a Halo movie? Yeah, it hasn't gotten a ton of press for some reason, but Microsoft actually went and made a feature-length live-action Halo movie tied in with the upcoming fourth game. If you're wondering how they solved the problem of Halo's main character being a one-note masked homunculus whom fans never want to see outside of his helmet, well, they made him not the main character. Instead, the film will follow the exploits of a new recruit whose experiences will involve Master Chief and the more familiar characters, but won't star them. The movie is going to be released over Xbox Live in episode format, and then put back together for the special editions of Halo 4. How will fans react to this version? We'll see. I think this might be the key for turning a lot of games into movies, if in fact that's what we decide we want to do. Unlike a book, a video game isn't only dependent on its story. It's also all about gameplay, aesthetics, and overall mood. In many cases, you can reach to those things in order to shape a narrative that may differ from the game, but might actually make for a better film. Basically, instead of approaching video game movies like making films out of books, approach it the way you do adapting a song to the plot of a movie, or in the way that historical films often add characters and events in order to give the audience more of a narrative through line. For example, let's look at Call of Duty. Now, in the past, the idea of a Call of Duty movie is one of those things I've dismissed as a non-starter. The games are trying too hard to be movies already, and any faithful adaptation would probably just end up being a generic military action movie, borrowing the game's title and little else. But thinking more deeply on the subject, I no longer agree with that sentiment. At least not entirely. I maintain that you won't be making a good movie out of Call of Duty's story, but you might be able to make one out of its gameplay and its main visual conceit. I mean, what's the point of the modern warfare games? to put you in the middle of the action. Granted, that's the purpose of all first-person shooters, 
but the Call of Duty games specifically want to put you in a battlefield situation that resembles the current ones you see on the news and in command of realistic, up-to-date combat weaponry. Well, why not just do that for the movie? Do the whole thing in first person. A gimmick, yes, but potentially a gimmick with purpose. See, in the games, we only see the action because that's the fun part to play through. But in a movie, you could also see other things a soldier experiences through a soldier's eyes. Yeah, still have plenty of shooting, but also training, boot camp, deployment, travel, leisure time, getting wounded, getting fixed up, walking through a marketplace or a city square and not knowing for sure who's friend or foe. In the right hands, that could be an incredibly unique movie-going experience for audiences. You want to know what it's like to be over there in the shit? Well, this is as close as you're going to get without enlisting yourself. With the right balance of action, story, and characterization, it could actually say something meaningful or even profound about the ever-widening gulf of perspective and experience between those of us who do the fighting and those of us they're fighting for. Now wouldn't that be something? Taking the series that's pretty much the Michael Bay movies of gaming and turning it into what would amount to an art house action movie. And that's not the only game that I think might benefit from a more high-minded approach. Take Metroid. If you just made a straight-up action movie out of it, well, congratulations, you've made Aliens. Again. But what if you actually more or less filmed the game? A character exploring a mysterious alien underworld full of strange creatures and bizarre sights with next-to-zero dialogue? That could easily lead to some 2001 or Terrence Malick shit right there. Now, those are two extreme examples. I'm not going to sit around and suggest that some high-minded, arty approach is the best way to adapt every game. A lot of the time, the answer strikes me as pretty straightforward, to the point that you have to wonder why the filmmakers decided that they had to do everything the hard way. Like, remember the Double Dragon movie? What the hell happened there? Double Dragon, and really every street brawler, was ripped off from a movie. It was called The Warriors, and it was awesome. The template is right there. Same deal with Street Fighter. It's a game about a martial arts tournament. Some of the best action movies ever made are about martial arts tournaments. Master of the Flying Guillotine, Duel to the Death, Enter the Dragon. It's a great, efficient device with which to keep lots of interesting characters in one place and make sure that a fight scene is always right around the corner when you need one. So why was the movie rocking that whole cut-rate G.I. Joe thing? Mortal Kombat at least got it right in that one department. They took a game about people who go to a supernatural fighting tournament and pretty much made that movie. Hell, they even stuck in the traveling by boat sequence from Enter the Dragon for good measure. The only real problem was that they made a Mortal Kombat movie but took out the one thing that everyone loves about Mortal Kombat. Oh, and before anyone asks, I saw the Mortal Kombat web series from a little while back and no, not for me. I mean, I understand what they were going for, but it just didn't work. I would honestly, given the choice, rather watch that damn TV show again. For real. The problem is that if you let the characters in a movie actually do to each other what they do in a Mortal Kombat game, the movie will be over really quickly and nobody will be back for the sequel. But here's an idea. Just have Shang Tsung explain that his already magical island gives everybody in the tournament some kind of Wolverine-level healing factor while they're there. I mean, not like immortal, they can still die from fatalities or if their heart or brain gets destroyed, but this way everybody can take crazy bloody battle damage and still participate in more than one fight. Problem solved. Yeah. You want that one, Warner Brothers? Call me. All right, all right, I know, I know. This has been a little small potato so far. I mean, this is the game overthinker. You want to hear what I think about movies based on the classics. Well, all right, let's take a look at a few. Mega Man seems hard to adapt at first because half the fun is the designs for the various robot characters, and you can lose a lot of that charm when you try to translate it into actors in costumes. But... Why do you have to do it that way? I mean, these guys are supposed to be robots, all of them, not people. So why not have real people play Dr. Light, Dr. Wily, and other humans, I'm assuming, must exist in the Mega Man universe, and then do Mega Man and the other robots looking more or less like themselves from the games with CGI, puppets, motion capture, and all that business? I mean, who's to say that bulgy and manga-esque isn't just the trendy way to design robots in 2000X? Look at what we're designing them to look like now. Castlevania. Easy. Okay, Simon Belmont goes through Dracula's castle to kill Dracula. You've got a good guy, you've got a building, you've got a bad guy. Yeah, Castlevania, die hard with Dracula. I repeat, die hard with Dracula. Die hard with Dracula. See, that's already a great pitch. I'm amazed someone hasn't already done that with or without the Castlevania license. Sonic the Hedgehog should probably stay a cartoon, though I am still looking forward to the fan film. The Legend of Zelda. 
Okay, I don't know why everyone thinks this is so difficult. The hardest thing about a Zelda movie would be getting Nintendo to actually license something for a movie again after what happened last time. Everyone gets hung up on Zelda because they assume the games themselves are too convoluted plot-wise, or you'd have to try and fit in all the bizarre stuff that's become part of the series from Ocarina onward, and I think that's easily solved by just going back to the basics. Triforce. Three of them. Ganon's got one, Zelda's got the other, so he takes her. Impa tells Link to go find the last one before Ganon's guys can get to it. Don't need to be in a bunch of different dungeons and different pieces, just one dungeon will do, it's only one movie. There you go! There's your film! Now you just need good actors and a good director to make that otherwise kind of basic fantasy setup more interesting. You don't have to show him getting every weapon, let him start with all his basic survival gear and have him get the Master Sword because pulling the sword from the stone scenes are money. Maybe involve the Ocarina, but have it work like the recorder from the first game. You Use Navi so he has someone to talk to. And because she's awesome. Dude, you have no idea. Navi and Ocarina was Robinson joining the Majors for us. Well then what's Tinkerbell? Oh, don't get me started on that house, Fairy. Okay then. Also, Navi, hot. Crazy hot. If you were a fairy, you'd understand. Like, ridiculous. Anyway, you don't need to do the Kokiri thing, just let Link be a wandering woods guy like he was back in the day. Don't need to get into the Temple of Time stuff, don't need to go to the Twilight Realm, don't need to talk about Skyloft, keep it simple the first time out. I guess maybe you should include the Light World, Dark World thing from Link to the Past, but maybe don't do any actual long-term crossing over until the end. In fact, have the last fight take place there. Visually interesting, decent bit of fan service, and you'll have an excuse to use Ganondorf Ganon and Blue Pig Ganon. And then, there's Mario. Super Mario Bros. isn't just the greatest and most famous of all video game franchises, it's also one of the only major series whose visuals and gameplay still openly maintain a blatant connection all the way back to the very beginning of the medium, with an aesthetic and level design that to this day is still based primarily around platforms, blocks, switches, enemies as obstacles, and color-coded everything. You can draw a straight line from the present day all the way back to the arcades through this one series. Super Mario Bros., after all, was titled literally, an expansion of the enemy-bopping, block-hitting gameplay of original Mario Bros., which in turn owed a lot to Joust. This is why the Mario universe feels so ill-suited to live action at first glance. It's still a much more expansive rendering of a world that was never meant to look anything but abstract. So, how would I get around that? Two words. Reverse engineering. Let me explain. Remember the NES Batman game? Wasn't exactly a one-to-one -one adaptation of the movie, but you did get the basic outline. Batman was the good guy, Joker was the bad guy, Batman had a car, Gotham City, a chemical plant, and an old church were involved, etc. Now, consider this. Pretend for a moment that the game had come first instead of the other way around. Then, try and figure the hypothetical formula by which this would have turned into this. Then, apply that to Mario. Imagine what the movie this game was based on would have looked like. Then, make that movie. For example, instead of trying to explain floating bricks, maybe there was a really memorable scene in the hypothetical movie that involved fighting on and smashing brick bridges and such. Hey, maybe that's the part where they fight the Hammer Brothers. Instead of pipes being randomly everywhere, maybe there's some kind of swamp-slash-aqueduct system they use to sneak into Bowser's fortress, and it's all full of piranha plants. Beyond that, all the various monsters and enemies aren't hard to work out at all. Like, half of Bowser's army are turtles just like him, and there's a long history of giant monster turtles working just fine in live action. See, CGI can do just about anything these days, after all, and if you still feel the need for something more humanoid for Mario and Luigi to knock around in the action scenes, there's always the Shy Guys. As for the backstory, I think you kind of have to go back to the they're from Brooklyn thing. I know, I know, it's not canon, whatever canon means in this case, but it solves a lot of problems. Chief among them being why the two best warriors in a fantasy kingdom are plumbers. Answer, they aren't from the Mushroom Kingdom. They're from Earth, and the difference in physics accounts for them having super strength, speed, jumping, and freaky magical reactions to the native plants. I mean, that's how it worked for John Carter. And you'd know that if anyone had seen that movie. And since their Earthling clothes would be just as supercharged for durability as they are, it excuses them still wearing the same stuff all the time. Plus, it gives them incentive for questing beyond saving this princess they just met, i.e. maybe Peach has the power to send them home. And you get potential character arcs for both Mario and Luigi that can play like fleshed-out versions of their stock game personas as the brave one and the scared one. Like, maybe back in Brooklyn, Luigi was always totally chill about just being a plumber, but Mario wanted something more exciting. Now they're in this crazy fantasy kingdom doing big-ass Lord of the Rings quest stuff, and Mario is all about it, but Luigi just wants to get shit done and go home. Over the course of their journey, Luigi maybe learns to embrace new experiences, and he's capable of more than he knows. Well, maybe Mario learns to appreciate what he had back home, and to be careful what you wish for. Drama. 
If you'll forgive me a bit of self-reference, I really do think that video game movies get tripped up by people overthinking the work. Lots of games have simple stories, yes, but that also means a lot of them are grounded in the same archetypal, iconic frameworks as some of our most classic stories and popular movies. It really shouldn't be this hard to get the game-to-movie transition ironed out. Comic book fans had to wait nearly 50 years to get from here to here. Hopefully gamers won't have to wait quite as long. Well, there you have it, folks. The Game Overthinker on video game movies. Ivan, tell the people what we do now that the episode is over. Well, now that the overthinking is done, we typically pick back up with whatever little adventure you're currently engaged in. But right now, you don't have one. Yep, today we're just chilling. So I guess that means we roll the credits and call it a show, yes? Actually, sir, no. Come again? Well, sometimes we actually cut away to some other goings-on that, while not directly involving you or me at the moment, are nonetheless relevant. In fact, frequently this creates anticipatory dramatic tension, as the audience is now in possession of important information before we are. No shit. Huh. Well, everyone, that's all for today. Thanks for watching, and enjoy whatever the hell it is you're about to see. We'll see you next time on The Game Overthinker. This is most vexing. Three stones I placed in the hands of would-be champions. Three stones the accursed overthinker now possesses. Only a matter of time before he discovers their true purpose. And mine. You have placed too much faith in the stones, my master like Virgin when they released Voodoo Lounge. It may be time for a new tactic. One final stone remains in play. And if its bearer fails, the Overthinker will have claimed all four. You forget your place, minion. But there is truth in what you say. What do you suggest? I beg you, my master. Give me a second chance. Restore my powers and my human form. Let me end the Overthinker's life. I swear I will not fail you again. Very well. But take heed. Disappoint me once more, and you will suffer beyond comprehension. Anti-Thinker. What up, Chief? I'm back. So the people at Sony Pictures, aka, wow, I should have deleted a bunch more emails, specifically the team behind the Amazing Spider-Man series, apparently have been talking to Nintendo about producing a new Super Mario Brothers movie. Yeah. Given what these people have already managed to do to Spider-Man, and given that I was there the last time somebody made a Mario movie, this idea pretty much horrified me. I mean, as both a gamer and a film critic, I've been imagining what a hypothetical Super Mario Brothers feature project might look like for, well, a long time, let's put it that way. And there's not much I could imagine that would be a worse fit for that property than this producer at this studio at this moment in time. And yes, I mean, I'd fully expect them to make something actually less good than the original Super Mario Brothers movie. And in case you forgot how that turned out... <laughs> Feeling we're not in Brooklyn no more. Luigi! You better not hurt us! They're brothers. They're plumbers. Oh no! Mario! Luigi! They're on the trail Luigi! of a kidnapped princess and a mystical meteorite. It's incredible! That gives anyone who possesses it oh! the power. To rule the universe. Get me the rock! Come and get it, lizard breath! No! They must.
must rescue the princess. Luigi! Alien species escaping. And make it safely back. Later, alligator. To our world. Are you all right? Before time runs out. Mario Brothers. This ain't no game. Now, to be fair, to be fair, most of that you can blame on it being the 90s. It was just not a great decade in many respects. Anyway, then I thought about how, given my job, I'd end up having to report on it, and having to follow its production, and eventually review the thing, and I was getting a little bit sick to my stomach, or maybe just irritated, until I got to the part where the big goal was apparently to turn the property into an animated franchise, at which point my reaction became more like, oh, Oh well, okay, some of Sony's cartoons have been good, I guess. Like, I wasn't totally against it anymore, but I hadn't crossed over into looking forward to it either. I just kind of slipped off into, okay, whatever territory. And it wasn't the first time. It seems like every instance where it looked like a Golden Age video game franchise was going to get a movie, there's always a big chorus that jumps in and says, it should be animated. Or more precisely, it should be anime. And I've never been able to get on board with that. Tell me tomorrow that Zelda is getting the big, full-scale Lord of the Rings treatment, you'll make my year. Tell me, hey, there's going to be a Zelda anime, eh, I I'll watch it when it gets translated, I guess. And what's strange is that I don't have anything against animation. I love animation. I've liked a lot of animated stuff based around games and comics and whatever else I'm into. I don't look down on animation. I don't consider it somehow lesser or unworthy. But when I think about something as big and meaningful as important in the popular culture as Super Mario Brothers, I mean, let's face it, this is still the face of gaming as an institution worldwide. The Superman of the medium. Yeah, I think it deserves the pomp and circumstance and weight that comes with a major live-action feature film. Maybe that's just me. When it comes to games and comics, I don't think the reasoning is all that complicated. Making the movie of something, to my mind, should feel like a major evolution from what it was to what it's ascending to become. And since 99% of games or comics are already drawn and or animated to some degree in their original format, it feels like a lateral move more than a meaningful evolution. I mean, realistically, they'd probably end up doing the Mario movie in CG, and in which case, what's the difference between that and just an extended cutscene? And A, I've already seen Mario cutscenes, and B, they're not going to do anything as cool as Subspace Emissary anyway, so why bother? I've also never quite gotten why people think Mario or Zelda or Mega Man or so many other classic game series don't don't belong in live action. I mean, I can see it for some, I don't know how you'd do Kirby in live action, or Sonic, or, I don't know, Bubsy. And on the comic side, I'm glad they're not trying to do Peanuts with real kids. But most of the time, I just don't see what's the big barrier supposed to be. I mean, there's been six Lord of the Rings movies at this point, and eight Harry Potters, but suddenly Zelda just couldn't possibly be put on screen? I've seen movies set in Oz, Middle-earth, Narnia, Wonderland, Mythological Greece, Asgard, and wherever the hell Legend, Willow, Dark Crystal, Maleficent, and Conan the Barbarian took place, but the Mushroom Kingdom? That's beyond the pale. The number one blockbuster on American movie screens this year starred a space raccoon, but two Italian guys in overalls that no one's gonna buy? I just don't see it. Seriously, though, Hollywood, consider this me begging for a Christmas miracle. It's been 21 years since anyone last took a shot at this franchise. It's one of the biggest and most recognized multimedia entertainment properties on the planet. Hell, I'd damn near guarantee you that before their movies started coming out, Super Mario Brothers was better known than any of the Avengers were, except maybe the Hulk, since he had that TV show once. So, not Sony, but... Can someone make this happen? Please? I think we've waited long enough. I'm Bob, and that's The Big Picture. Hey guys, it's me, Bob. Uh, so, a thing we like to do sometimes here on In Bob We Trust is we take movie projects that are in some kind of development hell or production trouble or just plain sound like terrible ideas and try to imagine how I might fix them if I was in charge of them. Entirely hypothetical, just for fun, etc, etc. Anyway, normally I spend like a whole episode on one project, but you know, sometimes it doesn't take a whole episode. Sometimes the fix is, or at least seems to me, to be pretty simple and or at least simple to explain. So with that in mind, here is a sampling of various maybe, maybe not film productions currently in some form of development and how they might be made not quite so terrible as they might sound in the first place. Yeah, that's, that's what we got this week. 
So Nintendo wants to do movies again, maybe, and they're loosening up enough to let Universal build theme parks, so who knows, maybe this will at last be a thing. They're mostly talking about focusing on animation, which I guess makes a certain amount of sense, but eh, I, I don't know, guys. I feel like you really want that, because potentially you get some kind of Studio Ghibli meets Pixar thing, but really, it just ends up being a bunch of executives trying to work out whether the Yoshis, the Toads, or the Shy Guys are the best candidates to be their answer to the fucking minions, and does anyone really want that? Look, the original live-action Mario movie had the right idea, a big fantasy adventure movie but with two funny blue-collar plumbers from Brooklyn, because that origin still makes the most sense, as your heroes instead of a Jedi or a Hobbit or whatever. It just had the exact wrong execution of that premise. They went for a 90s sci-fi dystopia thing, because that's what you could do on a budget. Today, not necessarily as difficult, providing you spend the money, to put together some sort of Pandora, Narnia, Naboo hybrid more true to the Mushroom Kingdom of the games, and at this point we really have had so many of these fantasy adventure movies that the whole angle of doing one where the heroes are just two regular working-class knuckleheads who can be weirded out or amazed by all the monsters and powers and shit would probably be a saleable pitch even if it wasn't based on something famous. I mean, it's The Wizard of Oz, but starring Abbott and Costello. That's a movie. Make that movie. So apparently we're getting a Call of Duty cinematic universe. This probably always would have been a terrible idea, and now it's a terrible idea that feels about five years out of date in terms of Call of Duty being a culturally relevant thing, but I think it can actually work. Here's the thing. Nobody gives a shit about any story ever told by a Call of Duty game, and recreating what's now become a typical Call of Duty cutscene in live action would cost more than most video game movies are going to earn, generally. Plus, the franchise is already so movie-like that taking away the video gameness is ditching the only thing that makes it unique. So my pitch would be to not do that. See, as popular as it is, and ubiquitous as it feels to gamers, most people worldwide have never actually played Call of Duty. But because it is pretty ubiquitous, basically anyone who'd conceivably go see this movie in the first place probably has a vague sense that Call of Duty is a military thing in first person. So for a movie, just do that. Do a war movie in first person. But not like some ironic hardcore Henry haha look how much like a video game this is. You do a serious war movie with plenty of action, yeah, but tonally in the vein of Full Metal Jacket, Jarhead, or Black Hawk Down, but the whole thing is in first person. Not just first person shooting. First-person basic training, first-person downtime, first-person recuperation, maybe even first-person saying goodbye to the family before deployment or first-person enlistment. Basically, you're using the first-person visual conceit to put the home front audience that only really experiences warfighting as detached TV news footage behind the eyes of the men and women who actually answer the Call of Duty. See, that would be both interesting and loaded with potential to tell affecting, impactful, maybe even important stories. And it gives you a hook for a franchise. Once you establish Call of Duty means first-person war movie, you can branch out. You can do one in Vietnam, Korea, Civil War, Iraq, Afghanistan, World War I, World War II, World War III, hopefully not, but who knows. Okay, so nine years later, Marvel finally released something that completely indefensibly sucks in Iron Fist, and now we're all kind of realizing that it feels like the big Defenders crossover is probably going to be made up mostly of that, plus the non-interesting B-story stuff from everyone else's shows, i.e. the big mystery hole from Daredevil, the boring pharmaceutical stuff from Jessica Jones, the mad science conspiracy stuff from Luke Cage, and that really doesn't sound like the makings of a great show. Unfortunately, it's a show they've already made, so yeah, whatever they're planning to do, they've already done. If it had been up to me, though, I would have said cut your losses. Nobody really gives a shit about the hand because you've made them too nebulous and ill-defined for anyone to give a shit about them, so you bring in something more interesting to reveal itself as the real supervillain of the piece. Maybe something from the movies, like that real Mandarin who's supposedly still out there somewhere. Or the Abomination, we never heard from him again. Or maybe somebody revived some of them dead Chitauri guys the Avengers left lying all over the city. Hey, that fits with the topical side of things. Or just use Hydra. Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. is still getting mileage out of that one. Anything is better than more boring hand bullshit. Do. Not. Do. An American. Remake. Of. Akira. <sighs> Look, the only people who would possibly care aren't going to like it. Ghost in the Shell just bombed spectacularly, and Scarlett Johansson opened Lucy as a big hit, so I'm thinking the problem probably wasn't her. It's a terrible idea, there's nothing to be gained, don't do it. That having been said, if you must do this, I do think there's probably a way. Okay, Akira is a fundamentally Japanese story in the specifics. You can't get around that, and yes, we've all seen that one Harry Pottridge cartoon. But the overall setup is, when considered in the broadest terms, made of some fairly universal themes. Alienated youth, urban gangs as surrogate families, dystopian futures, police militarization, exploitative government conspiracies, cover-ups, you just need to seriously think and work out the history behind them, and what that future you're creating says about the present that precedes it. Now, laying all those specifics out, 
I don't have them. Not really my job in this case. But if you're looking for a silver bullet starting point, I'd say it's pretty simple. Nobody wants a whitewashed Akira. But whitewashing and Americanizing don't have to mean the same thing. Yeah, now you see, right? I don't even have to spell it out. Think about the thematic components of Akira and how they might translate culturally to an American setting. Neighborhoods turned into dystopian war zones by poverty and neglect, abusively patrolled by brutish, overly militarized police forces in conflict with violent youth gangs that have filled the vacuum of family destroyed in large part by said poverty, neglect, and over-policing, oh, and vulnerable at-risk children being disappeared into the system, and God only knows what's happening to them. Yeah, yeah, we do have all of that here in the United States, as a matter of fact, and it disproportionately affects communities who generally don't get big sci-fi blockbusters made about them. So, wouldn't that be a thing? Oh, and don't call it Akira. Hardly anyone has heard of it in terms of a mainstream audience, so it doesn't really have a meaning, and the whole reason it was called that in the first place is that Akira is a really common Japanese name, and it's supposed to sound weird and creepy when people talk about it like they're talking about some kind of scary, ancient an ominous thing. So you call an American version like Adam or Michael or Kevin or something. <sighs> and uh, that's what we've got. Uh, hope you enjoyed it. Uh, these videos are usually pretty positively received. That's why we keep doing them. Okay, fine. Uh, let's take a shot at this one, finally. Uh, it's this, or do a whole show about James Cameron being wrong about Wonder Woman, and I, I could just not care less. So, these are the episodes where I take a look at movie franchises, or potential movie franchises, that have petered out, or hit the skids, or had trouble getting started, and act like I could fix everything with a pre-scripted, carefully edited brainstorming session, mostly comprised of really obvious storytelling 101 basics, which will nonetheless make me sound really inspired, because that's how bad so much of mainstream filmmaking is right now. Now. Anyway, Super Mario Brothers, or if you like, just Mario. It's the biggest, most influential, most widely known video game franchise in the history of ever, but nobody has really managed to make a proper movie of it. There was an anime back in the 80s that barely got released outside of Japan, a live action movie in the 90s that was just bad, and since then a whole lot of false starts and deals gone bad. Realistically, we're probably going to get one sooner than later because Nintendo partnered up with Universal to make theme parks, and that's widely being seen as a precursor to Universal Pictures doing Nintendo movies and Nintendo TV. A Nintendo something, so I feel like it's really likely that we'll get a Mario movie within the next decade, and it'll probably be animated, which, okay, would be fine. It'll be fine. I'm not against animation. I love animation. It's more just... You know, whenever the Nintendo movies thing happens for anything that isn't Metroid, everyone immediately goes to, oh, it should just be a cartoon. And as I said, I'll happily watch a feature-length Mario cartoon. Fine. But I feel like that everything a little bit fanciful should just be animated default argument when it comes to video game movies misses that one of the main reasons to adapt a story or a character or a world to another medium is to take advantage of what that medium can offer to present said story in a new way. And what a proper live-action adaptation of something that was already written, drawn, animated, or whatever offers is to add tangibility, a visceral, tactile sense of something imaginary having been brought to life. Besides, an animated Mario movie, well again, I'd take it, it will be fine, just doesn't strike me as an interesting challenge. We've seen Mario animated already. There's been like five or six animated Mario projects officially, hell, all the games are technically animated, and let's face it, Western feature animation is in kind of a rut right now, and this is not going to be a Pixar joint, so unless we're going to get some kind of really unique quasi-avant-garde thing with it, like that hand-painted Van Gogh movie, or the moving toy stuff from the Lego movies, or even Leica's material. Actually, though, sidebar, what Leica should be doing would be the Zelda movie. I mean, that would be amazing, and that was basically what Kubo and the Two Strings already was. See, so, do you really want THE Mario movie to be one of those assembly line, nut job, open season, trolls, Nomeo and Juliet, every Ice Age after the second one things, where the main creative decisions were which of the Koopalings should sound like Kevin Hart, and which one should sound like Sheldon, or whether the Shy Guys or the Toads are better positioned to be our answer to the fucking minions? Didn't think so. Besides, if Guardians of the Galaxy, Lord of the Rings, and Ninja Turtles can all be live-action movies, Mario can be a live-action movie. So yeah, short version, this hypothetical I'm proposing here presupposes a live-action adaptation because if it was up to me, that's what I'd be pitching. And since it's my show, it is up to me. 
So, the second biggest argument people always have against a Mario movie, or really any movie of Golden Age video game properties, is there's no story. Which is bullshit, of course there's a story. Some people have to rescue a person from a place is a story. In fact, that's a lot of story. And even if it weren't already a bunch of stories, if we have to take this magic ring from here to here and drop it in a volcano, can be three movies totaling 11 and a half hours of screen time, you can get 90 to 120 minutes out of two guys trying to rescue a princess from a dragon. You just have to be smart about plugging in the specifics. Now, I did a blog post like three years ago of a really detailed, kind of overly serious Mario movie outline, which you can read here that I think is fan y but still kind of okay, I guess. But for keeping it simple on this episode, you really just have to answer basic questions. Why are the Koopas and the Mushroom People fighting? What does Bowser specifically hope to accomplish by kidnapping Princess Peach? Why is sending two guys and maybe a third guy and a dinosaur the best option for getting her back? That feels like a pretty low three-question bar to clear structure-wise. The slightly more difficult issue is the key questions of who are our heroes and why are they the heroes, and that's because you actually have to commit to a backstory that the franchise doesn't meaningfully have anymore if it ever did at all. Now for me, it's not even a question. You go with the two plumbers from Brooklyn origin. Yes, in part because that was the more or less official from about the 80s up until 1995 or so Mario backstory that I grew up with, so it'll always be the truth to me, but also because all things considered, it just makes the most sense and gives you a lot to work with in terms of story and character. See, if they're from the Mushroom Kingdom, you've either got to dilute the gravity of your storyline by front-loading too much haha -ha, lol video games meta absurdity too soon too up front, i.e. why are they Italian-American stereotypes if there's no Italy or America in this world? Why do they have superpowers? If they weren't born with superpowers, where'd they get them? If they were born with superpowers, why do they work as just regular plumbers? And either way, why are plumbers going on this rescue mission as opposed to like some soldiers? Or you've got to stop the movie and waste time actually answering all of that. But being two regular guys from Brooklyn who get transported to a magical world just makes more sense. It explains the powers, i.e. differences in physics between different worlds a la Superman's Red Sun, Yellow Sun thing. It makes them more relatable to the audience since they'll be experiencing everything for the first time too, i.e. it lets the necessary exposition of what's going on and why flow much more naturalistically, and two guys meet a giant turtle, they already know how to beat it, and they do, is way less interesting than two guys meet a giant turtle, they've never seen anything like that before, what are they gonna do? It even gives you a ready-made, easily understood, potentially appealing pitch to audiences who might not care about the franchise otherwise. It's a fantasy quest movie, but instead of knights and elves and dwarves or whatever, the good guys are just too regular average working-class Italian schmoes from Brooklyn. Even if there'd never been a series of Mario video games, that's a pretty good solid pitch. Also, I mean, not for nothing, movies about archetypally ordinary people becoming heroes after being unexpectedly deposited in a fantasy kingdom have some pretty solid history of being, you know, pretty successful. I mean, I think a few of you recognize these images, right? Oh, uh, P.S. In terms of tone, I would say that some kind of mashup between Wizard of Oz and the Hope and Crosby Road movie would be absolutely the way to go for this particular franchise, though as like an action comedy with a family-friendly approximation of old-school, blue-collar, New York sense of humor. It also, if you want it, gives us a foundation to build characterization. As far as the games generally go, Mario is the brave one and Luigi is the coward. Now that's a little thin, but if you do the visitors from another world thing, plus that, maybe you've got more to work with. Maybe Mario is kind of a dreamer who always wanted more than being a plumber, so this is an opportunity for adventure and he's more on board immediately. Maybe Luigi is a guy who's more okay with their lives the way they were, so he just wants to go home, and maybe for some reason they can't do that without going on the rescue mission. And then over the course of the journey, Luigi learns to be more adventurous, Mario learns that he valued his old life more than he thought he did. Oh, hey, and maybe Mario is, like, self-conscious about just being a plumber, but it ultimately turns out that plumbing skills save them where their new powers fail, like, if they know how pipes and sewers work and that's how they infiltrate Bowser's castle. Hey, look at that! Now you can do the jumping in and out of green pipes thing. And that's also something you've got to decide. How much of the more surreal stuff from the games are you going to keep? Like, hovering bricks probably take more explanation than they're worth, but you could totally have a sequence in, like, some crumbling ancient ruins or whatever where one of the ways they fight the bad guys is by jumping and punching up through the brick platforms, right? That's a good aesthetic starting point for figuring this kind of stuff out. Imagine that the movie came first, and then reason out where the game would have adapted its elements from. Now the items and the power-ups and stuff, okay, a little more difficult, but first movie, you keep it simple. They're super strong, super fast, jump high because they're from a different universe, like you already said. Fire flowers probably work, green mushrooms for healing makes sense, maybe the super mushrooms to make you bigger but only for a short time. There's stuff you can have fun with there. The enemies, first movie again, so you don't need 
need to go overboard. Just think of it in terms of what would organize an actual army. Infantry, special forces, air support, artillery, snipers, kamikaze, stealth, assassin, ninjas, I guess would work for the Shy Guys. And then things like Goombas, Piranha Plants, Spinies, and all the water creatures can just be like wild animals that aren't necessarily with Bowser, but still dangerous to run into all the same. Maybe throw in some especially dangerous one-off monster encounters like Birdo, Triclide, Resnor. You don't have to do the Koopa Kids right away, but probably have generals on hand like Kamek, Fawful, Mouser for the undercard scenes and so Bowser has guys to talk to. Speaking of which, Princess Peach and Bowser, okay, yeah, she probably needs some work as a character. I know, I know, it's easy to just say, have her be on the quest with them, but then why are they on the quest to begin with? And I'm sorry, you can't do the first proper based on the games Mario movie and not have it be about rescuing Princess Peach from Bowser's castle. That'd be like doing a Justice League movie where Superman is dead, or a Dark Phoenix movie where the X-Men never go to space, and no one would be stupid enough to do that. I mean, yeah, certainly give Peach an action scene, sure. Like, maybe give her the parasol from Super Princess Peach and rip off that Umbrella Foo stuff from Once Upon a Time in China. That'd be fun for a bit, but I feel like you can still otherwise do the traditional rescue storyline, if only for the first movie, but use the scenario to make her and our villain more substantive as characters. So, like, instead of putting her in a dungeon or whatever, maybe Bowser does the overconfident bad guy thing where he lets the prisoner walk around the grounds because where the hell is she even going to go? It's his whole kingdom. And then eventually you can just do scenes where the two of them actually have to talk about why their people are at war, what their respective endgame is. Maybe she's a lot more clever or sly than we expect. Maybe he's, okay, if not smarter, more thoughtful than we expect. And maybe there could be a class thing here. Peach is an aristocratic generational monarch. Bowser is like a barbarian king, military strongman who feels his power is more legitimate because he fights to keep it and maybe sees himself more like Hannibal resisting Roman expansion than as a villain in his own right. I mean, like I said, that's just me spitballing, but you know, there's something to work with there. You know, just whenever we need a break from the brothers adventuring, you cut back to these two adding nuance to things, at least until Bowser does whatever the Mushroom Kingdom version of blowing up Alderaan is to remind us he's the bad guy and make the final Mario Brothers versus Bowser battle mean something. So you get the story everyone knows and showed up to see, but now with nuance and character depth. And if you absolutely need Peach to do some more action girl stuff, fine, have her get her hands dirty in that big final battle. Oh, and Bowser needs to be big. Not like Godzilla big, but at least T-Rex big. Like, he should be able to carry Peach around in his hand. So, anyway, yeah, there's a story, a backstory, heroes, villains, clear outline of fleshed out arcs and characterizations for all of them, and an overall solid, sturdy skeleton, in my opinion, to add the muscle of details, dialogue, and plot specifics to, in order to have a functioning narrative whole. And by the way, the overwhelming majority of it, drawn strictly from material available in the games, as opposed to trying to add or drastically improve or reimagine it. Now, granted, I've been trying to figure out how a Mario movie would work for like 30 years, but does any of that sound that difficult to make work? Because I don't think so. Like, to me, this just sounds like a movie that should have come out by at least the early 90s, spawned three or four sequels of varying quality, and an upcoming reboot we're all a little nervous about. But now I'm rambling. So I'm Bob. That's how I'd fix the Super Mario Brothers live-action movie franchise. What do you think? Hey, so there wasn't a full-blown new episode for this past week because I ended up buckling down and finishing part the second of Really That Bad Batman v Superman. And it takes time and concentration if I'm going to bring you insightful, intellectually stimulating film criticism like this. <laughs> In any case, we should be back on schedule for next week coming. But I didn't want to let this week run out without at least giving you something, even if it's something partially comprised of callbacks to a previous episode, which I always feel kind of guilty doing, even when it's called for like in this case. And plus, I really wanted to talk about the news that since Universal is building the Nintendo theme park, Nintendo has decided to trust them to make the first Nintendo movie since the failed Mario Brothers movie in the 90s, excluding the Pokemon movies and that Animal Crossing anime they didn't bother to release outside of Japan. Yeah! <laughs>
Thing is, you might remember I already did a Mario movie episode two months ago for one of the How to Fix episodes. In that episode, I posited that I was personally more interested in seeing a proper live-action Super Mario Bros. movie than I was in the much more likely and not at all inherently bad prospect of an animated feature. For, you know, reasons. Everything a little bit fanciful should just be animated default argument when it comes to video game movies misses that one of the main reasons to adapt a story or a character or a world to another medium is to take advantage of what that medium can offer to present said story in a new way. Tangibility, a visceral, tactile sense of something imaginary having been brought to life. So as you can imagine, I'm not exactly over the moon to learn that not only will Universal's Mario movie be animated, but it'll be handled by Illumination Studios, best known for the Despicable Me franchise, which, lest fakes it, means they're best known for the Minions. Cue unfortunately prescient callback. Do you really want THE Mario movie to be one of those assembly line, nut job, open season, trolls, Nomeo and Juliet, every Ice Age after the second one things, where the main creative decisions were which of the Koopalings should sound like Kevin Hart and which one should sound like Sheldon, or whether the Shy Guys or the Toads are better positioned to be our answer to the fucking minions? Didn't think so. Now look, I don't really have anything against Illumination per se. They're a decent enough studio, they employ a lot of talented people, and I actually thought Sing was a pretty great movie, and remember, I'm about as predisposed to hating what is essentially American Idol, the movie starring celebrity-voiced animals as you can get. And it's not so much the minions I despise as it is what trying to make that lightning strike twice has led the rest of feature animation to do in reaction to them. But in processing this, what I find myself grappling with is whether or not hoping to see this particular property ever become a great film is being unrealistic on my part. Do I honestly believe there's something greater to be found in there among the pixels, or am I just overstating what was ultimately the best and most enduring among the other marginally plotted, thinly characterized, colorful romps of the golden age of video games because a big sweeping quasi-epic fantasy adventure is what it ballooned up into in my imagination when I was obsessively playing the games and submerging myself in Nintendo and Femora in my formative years. I mean, my headcanon still defaults to the Brothers from Brooklyn thing, and even if it was sort of the default official backstory from the 80s to the early 90s, at least in the West, it hasn't been for a while. Beyond that, for as many characters as there are and as many self-contained story digressions get played out in the Mario RPG installments, there's not really that much more narrative meat in the Mario franchise in the mainline games than there is in, say, Rampage, and that seems to have found its appropriate level in terms of film adaptation as an expensive yet still goofy looking B-monster movie starring The Rock. It's like how when people ask me how can you say Batman v Superman was worse than Suicide Squad, and well, it's because we know for a fact that Batman and Superman movies can be substantially better than that, whereas even a good version of Suicide Squad as a property that wasn't such a goddamn narrative mess could only ever realistically aspire to being high-end grindhouse trash and expensive-looking trauma movie, basically. So yeah, it's possible that even though the games themselves are timeless classics, being one of those disposable, biannual animated comedy franchises full of dopey comedy and clunky references that mainly exist because you can sell twice as many tickets because kids have to bring a parent or their friends is where the Mario franchise belongs as a movie property. Yeah, that's a possibility worth considering, introspection and all that, but I still don't completely buy it. And despite my misgivings, I'll continue to hope that even if Illumination's Mario movie isn't good, Illumination! Illumination! <laughs> maybe this at least permanently breaks the dam open and we won't have to wait another 20 years for someone to try again. And if one of the most moving scenes in a movie this past year can be centered on Rocket Raccoon, I'm not going to stop maintaining that the Mario universe probably deserves better than it's going to get from a studio whose best movie is about animals doing cover songs. Detective Pikachu comes out soon. My review will post on Escape to the Movies, but for now, it's good. Is it the best video game movie ever? I mean, it's the best video game movie ever that doesn't have The Rock in it. George, you okay? Ready to do this, buddy? Yeah. 
So I guess, spoiler, The Rock isn't in this. But yeah, it's a ton of fun, both a good movie and a good Pokemon movie. And to a lot of people, that sounded like a strange idea, building the first live action attempt at such a huge franchise like Pokemon around a minor spin-off title like Detective Pikachu. But it ends up making a shocking amount of sense. The problem with doing a Pokemon movie was always going to be that the player character is generally a blank slate. The Pokemon themselves are obviously the stars, but they can't really deliver dialogue. The world of the games themselves run on really strange, not quite reality logic that requires a lot of explanation if you're going to do something like a sports movie but about Pokemon battles. And I mean, the anime made it mostly work, and I guess you could adapt that, but is Ash really that much of an improvement over a blank slate? Is he though? Is he really? I mean, I guess like if you got like two really funny people, you could date a good comedy duo for a Team Rocket movie since their Pokemon talk, so it's like a, you know, a crime duo movie but for Pokemon. That, that sounds kind of fun. Really fun, actually, but maybe it's more of a sequel thing than a first movie. But Detective Pikachu, turns out, makes a lot of sense. Audiences are generally familiar with detective movie tropes as a genre, so that can be the main thrust of the plot, with Pokemon battles and evolutions in gyms and other world-building details as part of the story to get introduced, but not as the focus. The gimmick of the talking Pikachu that the only the lead kid understands lets the most popular figure in the series. You know, the mascot takes center stage in the form of a slightly alternate take that lays things out for new fans, it fits together, it works. It even sets things in place nicely to do a more traditional Pokemon story if they end up wanting to do more of these, which, yeah, they're probably going to end up doing more of these. And it leads me to think, you know, we've talked about game movies on here a couple times before, and last week we looked at the awful looking Sonic trailer. Uh... Meow? You know, maybe there's something to this whole looking at pieces of the game instead of the whole game or the whole franchise for what to do with these adaptations. Like, Illumination, the Minions people, are doing the animated Mario movie, which feels like a mistake, but keep an open mind, I guess. But you know, while trying to find a cinematic narrative within the purposefully slim and malleable Mario setup as defeated filmmakers before, maybe it would have been or would be a more sensible idea for them to do what Detective Pikachu did. Maybe start out with a movie about, say, just Yoshi, and maybe the Toads, and assorted other little monster guys. Funny animals being funny is something animation is pretty reliably good at, and it would be a way to build a strong foundation for that universe, and you could add more characters later with more focus. Maybe that would be the key. I mean, think about this. We just finished this big elaborate thing with the Avengers cycle and the whole bigger Marvel Cinematic Universe business, and it's worth remembering that they started that whole thing out with a movie about Iron Man, a character very few non-comic book fans had any real attachment to at the time, whose robot suit gimmick and grab bag of C-list enemies weren't exactly screaming for a feature film. He wasn't a Wolverine or a Spider-Man. Sure, he was an Avenger, but he wasn't like the Hulk or Captain America or even Thor for decades. His central contribution to that team in the comics was being their landlord. So he might not have seemed like an obvious place for Marvel to start, but his simple kidnapped billionaire genius forced to make a weapon suit origin story updated topically for a war on terror setting and recast with Robert Downey Jr.'s comeback charisma made him an unexpectedly ideal vessel for post-9-11 catharsis for U.S. audiences that also held a global appeal. From that seemingly offside beginning, they grew an entire universe. Now, of course, we all do remember that someone did in fact try this once before with a video game movie in Street Fighter The Legend of Chun-Li. Right? Well, I assure you that was a real movie that absolutely did happen, and it was supposed to be the first of multiple solo Street Fighter origin movies. And it was awful, though Chris Klein's scenes were memorable, I guess. Gangland homicide? Call me Nash. You just inherited a big problem. I'm chasing around an organization called Shadow His name's Bison. And I've tracked him through 11 major cities on four continents and never come close, not once. This guy walks through the raindrops. Bob! Everybody out! Hey, you better get out of here. You don't want a ticket to this dance, detective. But that doesn't invalidate the concept, just the execution. Especially when the gaming world continues to be full of unique and interesting supporting secondary or tertiary characters like Alex Vance, Poison, King Hippo, and dozens of others who could be the unexpected entry point to an adaptation of their respective franchise. You know, or failing that, you could always just take the main character and give them a different hat.
So uh, to briefly address the elephant in the room and a bit of talk that'll end up stuck on the front of whichever of these episodes ends up posting first. <laughs> yeah, we ended up running fewer episodes the back end of this year than I wanted to. Uh, you know, if you watch for a while, I've heard the reasons before, and it's not really anything new. I've got more than one gig that divides my time. The YouTube algorithm changes all the time. Trying to balance making the channel still show up there versus delivering stuff people come to expect is challenging. But also, we seem to wind up in a space where covering the exact type of stuff and even topics we wanted to cover or were covering ended up being things that stretched on and on and on. Like, how many fucking Flash, Flashpoint, DCEU episodes did I even do over the last couple years, and now we're almost at the end of that fucking mess? Maybe, please, I think I ended up throwing out five or six near full episode scripts between the last one and right now because every time I'd get to okay things seem to be stable for a bit let's make a flashpoint update or what should happen at DC update and then news would come out like Ezra Miller just hijacked a plane to Candy Apple Island or David Zaslav sold Westworld for a handful of magic beans and then there's other times where I should cover this but it's a downer and I don't want to and I've got a backlog of reviews to get to instead fuck I forgot to review nope wow and that sounds less mentally taxing, or those other projects I need to get further toward completion so I can actually show off what they are, so it sounds less like we're just making shit up, and hey, get the Patreon numbers climbing up again, cause uh, yeah, things are tough all over, so if you can chip in, or know anyone who'd like to chip in, by all means, please be our guest. <laughs> Regardless, yes, now that it's official, we should have a James Gunn at DC episode incoming. It's about time to do the obligatory Marvel Phase 4 thing, and I guess since I did an Elon show, we should probably talk about the Kanye of it all. I'm done with the classifications. Every human being has something of value that they brought to the table, especially Hitler. <laughs> the, the Holocaust is not what happened. Let's look at the facts of that. And Hitler has a lot of redeeming qualities. Why would he do that? He's a jackass. <laughs> There's a lot of things that I love about Hitler. When they declare war, it's all out. They had to become the Black Gestapo. <laughs> But before all that, I feel like what people have asked me about most recently is why I didn't talk more about the Mario movie. Which, okay, fair, I've got something of a reputation as kind of a big Super Mario fan from way back, maybe even more so than other Nintendo Generation 80s kids. Over the years, I've had my share of opinions on the franchise and media, and whether or not or how they ought to put a movie together. <laughs> I feel like it's really likely that we'll get a Mario movie within the next decade, and it'll probably be animated, which, okay, would be fine. I'm not gonna stop maintaining that the Mario universe probably deserves better than it's going to get from a studio whose best movie is about animals doing cover songs. Yeah, so I was both, I think, kind of surprisingly right about this, and also kind of weirdly bitter, especially about doing his animation, which I stress I have the opposite of a problem with as a medium. I was just kind of hoping they'd try it with live actors again, because to me that feels like the more interesting filmmaking challenge, or maybe if they'd gone with a more distinct animation design style than what all the games have looked like in the past 20 years, but I'm not going to give them shit going with the Nintendo House style when the theme park is coming up. I mean, that's kind of obviously what they were going to do, and just look how weird people are already being about the extremely minor changes they've made to the character designs to, I would imagine, make everyone just a little bit more expressive, or line up with where the actors took the voice performances. So as it goes now, there's trailers and posters, and this really is finally coming out, and look, objectivity was always going to be somewhat impossible one way or another here. I think it looks good. Fine? Better than fine, yeah. I mean, it looks so much like exactly what you'd expect, I feel like it's hard to be really blown away by just the existence of any of it, but on the other hand, you've heard me say for years that at least two things a Mario movie could do that'd get me totally on board would be to have the Tanuki suit on screen or go back to the Brooklyn origin, and I guess we're doing both of those things. They should have said the poet. So beautiful. 
So, I'm a man of my word. All right, let's do this. As far as the rest of it goes, I think it looks cool. Yeah, Charlie Day, Seth Rogen, and Jack Black are all inspired casting for Luigi, Donkey Kong, and Bowser. I think the Kongs are going to be a breakout thing here. It's a whole race of comedy monkeys. People love monkeys. It's just an easy call that Nintendo has never really properly seized on for whatever reason. Luigi being the guy that needs rescuing, you know, so it's Mario and Peach on the quest is a fun way to solve the damsel in distress thing and keep the characters distinct between the two brothers. I would say Anya Taylor-Joy is pretty much ideally cast as literally Literally the woman millions of men my age have been looking for their entire lives, so good job there. And giving Princess Peach action hero stuff to do may be an easy decision, but it's still a good decision overall. And frankly, I don't really have an issue with Chris Pratt's voice so far. It's different from Charles Martinet's voice from the game, but his version was never really made to deliver full sentences or a full movie performance or even deliver actual English lines, as opposed to Italian-ish gibberish in a video game. And you can hear Pratt doing a guy from New York thing with it. I was hoping for a less recognizable, more Italian guy sounding thing, but again, it sounds fine to me so far. It'll work. The thing is, on one hand, I'm not jumping up and down nuts about it, not because there's anything wrong with it. It looks cool, but I guess because it looks like a Mario movie aimed at an audience of kids and young adults who've come into being fans of the games over the last 20 years of them, you know, rather than being a big dopamine nostalgia button thing for 40-year-old Nintendo fan gamers like me, and that's kind of how it should be, especially since it's a kids movie. Whereas, yeah, I bet something that was more inside baseball, retro gamer references, obscure Mario lore would have me paying more attention, but probably wouldn't be tracking as big with, like, my niece and nephew, who are both very excited for this. That's appropriate. That's where this should be. Maybe there will be more to say about it when it finally actually comes out or there's more trailers, but for now, yeah, that's what I've got for that. Mario movie. Looks decent. I hope it's good. I'm Bob, and that's the big picture. You know, I'm not gonna say I'm nostalgic for the days when every even marginally popular toy or video game got an obligatory cartoon because TV is weird. But it is kind of weird that that seems to happen less now, right? I mean, I know the Saturday morning cartoon concept isn't really a thing anymore, what with streaming, but shouldn't there be at least like a Minecraft show or something? Hell, I remember when there was a Monster Rancher cartoon at one point. Did that many people even ever play Monster Rancher? Anyway, video game cartoons in particular tend to have a kinda iffy reputation. Most of the big ones from the Golden Age were cheaply produced and often didn't properly represent or even have much to do with the games, especially given that the US companies translating mostly Japanese imports in the 8 and 16-bit era were often not provided with much information as to what the games were supposed to be about. Sure, there are standouts, there seems to be a rough majority consensus that Sonic Sadam was the best Sonic cartoon overall, and I'm a huge apologist for the Super Mario Bros. Super Show, but for my money, the gaming series of that era that deserves the most reappraisal is Captain N, The Game Master. Captain N, the Game Master. Yes, Captain N was cheap and cheesy, its lore and storyline were wildly inconsistent, it's a nakedly commercial experience and watching it as either an adult or a kid who's grown up in a slightly more sophisticated era of children's TV animation today can be jarring to say the least. But that's equally true of Transformers, G.I. Joe, Power Rangers, Sailor Moon, the US dubbed version anyway, and even Pokemon. And the internet is drowning in think pieces about how there's merit and something more to be found in all of those, so why no retro love for my boy Kevin Keen? I think part of it is because, despite the premise, the series didn't really do fan service in quite the way fans at the time were expecting. Nintendo basically handed Deke a short story from Nintendo Power called Captain Nintendo, which I guess the guy apparently who thought it up never even got paid for? That's not cool. That was intended to create a company-branded mascot just in case Mario didn't stay consistently popular for the next several decades, and Deke proceeded to throw out everything but Mother Brain being the main villain, and instead constructed a more conventional teenager becomes a hero on another world show, populated by whatever licensed game characters struck their particular fan within the time frame they had to think these things up. For example, Samus Aran isn't in there because Nintendo never bothered to tell the studio that the main character from Metroid had a name. I'm sorry I didn't take you seriously before, 
I couldn't believe that this was real. So instead, you got a weird assortment of mostly NES era second stringers on the Goody and Batty teams, most of them hugely redesigned and with broad cartoon stock character personalities. That seems to be another reason gamers don't look back on the show fondly. They got all kinds of details wrong. And I get that. As a kid, I remember wishing Mega Man looked more like himself and being annoyed that they made Simon Belmont into a total douchebag. There's only one person who can cheer up the princess, and I'm looking at him. I shall give the orders. Mega Man, shine my boots. Kid Icarus, I could use a little trim. Not too much off the top, however. Simon, let go of me. But looking back from today, it makes total sense why they did it, and I'm inclined to be way more forgiving. The fact is, especially since there was no internet in 1989, you had to do a real deep dive if you wanted to know anything about what most video game heroes' personalities were actually supposed to be. And even then, it wasn't always especially rich in that era. A proper rendering of each character in this show would have saddled Kevin Keane with a team of the noble hero, the noble robot hero, and the noble hero with wings. That's not a lot of fun dynamics to play around with. Meanwhile, among the villains, Dr. Wily, Eggplant Wizard, and King Hippo all seemed pretty much on point. And even if they didn't, Motown legend Levi Stubbs makes up for it with his inspired casting as Mother Brain. Then I'll be the beautiful queen of video land! <laughs> <laughs> And as much as it feels like a missed opportunity that they seem to barely scratch the surface of all the different game worlds they could have visited even back then, in an era when there was no Twitter to spoil the plot of every TV episode before you watched it, it was a real trip to turn on Captain N and be surprised by an episode randomly taking place around stuff like Faxanadu or The Adventures of Bayou Billy or California games. Hell, in Season 2, the weird, snarky, smug asshole versions of Link and Zelda from the Super Mario Bros. Super Show started showing up. Mm -hmm. You two heroes can pat yourselves on the back some other time. We have important business. Oh yeah, right, Ganon! Ganon? I thought you wiped him out for good! So did I, but we just heard a rumor that someone's trying to bring him back! Wow, you got any clues? That blew my mind back then, in and of itself, and then they did one where Kevin and Link teamed up and went to... an NES game about Puss in Boots. Okay, sure. I still contend that this is the most badass version of Princess Zelda, by the way, apart from when she's deliberately trying to disguise that she is Princess Zelda. But looking back on Captain N today, the thing that weirdly sticks out the most is how ahead of his time the Captain is. Dancing is easy. Here, I'll show you. Ooh, I like this. I've got some pretty cool power moves, too. No, seriously, hear me out. See, I've always been bugged by this idea that the circumstances of who you are is supposed to have some specific sway over what you're into. Like, hip-hop isn't for white guys, punk rock isn't for black guys, boys have to do this, girls have to do that, you can't like sports if you're into smart stuff, or you can't be smart if you're also an athlete, a nerd is this, a jock is that, or if you're gay, you're not supposed to be into... I don't even know anymore. Most of my friends are really nice, so I'm not really up on what all the current stereotypes and prejudices are. Point is, back in the 80s and 90s, being big into video games was often viewed as kid stuff in general and nerd stuff if you were any older. And even though I'm proud as hell to be both a gamer and a nerd myself, I don't know, forcing people into boxes isn't cool. But in Captain N, what little we're able to discern about Kevin Keane as a character shows him living well outside of the games are for nerds, shut-ins, etc. stereotype that still crops up even today, starting with the fact that he's not designed to look like a nerd. And back then, if a TV character was supposed to be a nerd, they let you know. Check out this inverted kickflip! Wow, he's mega rad. In the Season 2 episode, Big Game, we briefly meet some of Kevin's friends from high school back on Earth, and it's confirmed that he's overall a pretty well-rounded guy. In addition to being known for his gaming prowess, he was smart enough to tutor his classmates. Hey! Aren't you that video game whiz who helped me study for my algebra test? Hi, Stacy. You remembered. It was just that one time, and when I asked you for a date, you were busy, but... Your name's Kerwin, right? And his iconic red N jacket? Turns out that wasn't just a random coincidence. That's a Letterman jacket, which he earned on his JV swim team. Yo, now I remember. You're on the junior varsity swim team, right? And you're Rick Walker, captain of the varsity football team. Hey, welcome to Video Land. And in case you didn't know, competitive swimming is a pretty involved, training-intensive sport. So this guy is sociable, athletic, generally well-rounded as you can reasonably expect to be as a high schooler, and he's a game master in an era when the only way to master any game was to practice and memorization. In many respects, Captain N was closer to the games are for all of us ideal of today than the limiting gamer stereotypes of his own time. Kevin, are cheerleaders chosen from the nobility where you come from? Uh, not exactly. Oh, you seem very impressed with this Stacy. 
Now, I don't know if all that makes Captain N the Game Master the best game cartoon or some kind of misunderstood classic, but it's definitely underrated, underappreciated, and it absolutely deserves another look from gamers now. One human alone could never beat me! <laughs> Maybe not alone, Mother Brain, but we can defeat you as a team! Oh! Especially since it's not like today is that much better. Have you tried to watch Sonic Boom? Last week, I took you on a tour through the nostalgic masochism of terrible video game cartoons, during which I happened to mention that I thought some such things actually still held up, kinda. Like the uniquely bizarre Captain N the Game Master, a cross-franchise team-up vehicle made possible by the Nintendo of the 1980s exercising the kind of control over their third-party content rivaled only by Tulsa Doom. Whatever the relative merits of Captain N actually were, it had the rare distinction among game-based cartoons of actually being popular and decently successful in its day. A rarefied honor shared only by the Super Mario Bros. Super Show, the two Sonic series, and Mega Man in the same era. Naturally, any successful series is going to have its imitators, but you'd think a team-up show like Captain N would be hard to knock off, considering not every license holder is likely to boast a roster of characters that could fill out a proper group. Well, you'd be right about that. But in 1990, Acclaim decided to try anyway, teaming up with Bobbit Entertainment and future Power Rangers mogul Hayam Saban to create Video Power. <laughs> Video Power was a slightly different animal than Captain N. Oh, it had a team of video game heroes being led around by a human kid, but instead of getting zapped into the game world himself, our main character, Johnny Arcade, really, commanded a team of game characters who'd been zapped into the real world. But even though they were ostensibly in the same universe, he didn't fight alongside them. Johnny just kind of directed the action from his game console and occasionally got involved. As for the membership, well, you work with what you have. And what Acclaim had at the time was a bunch of games that they didn't develop themselves, but rather published or ported to the Nintendo Entertainment System from arcade developers mostly. So here's the team they put together. First up, Kuros from Wizards and Warriors. This is actually what got me to watch this show at the first place. I loved Wizards and Warriors. Hey, where's my revival of that? Anyway, good pick, big dude with a sword, looking all Conan like he did on the boxes instead of the games where he was a knight, but whatever. Promising start, at least. Next up, Max Force from NARC. Yeah, NARC was the sh**. When you saw a narc machine at the pizza place or roller rink or wherever, you played it while you could, because it was only a matter of time before somebody's mom complained about the violence and it got taken away. Since this was a kid's show, Max Force doesn't get to have his gun. Instead, he has a utility belt and a lot of gadgets. Okay, whatever, still a good enough start. Who else you got? Tyrone from Arch Rivals. Arch Rivals was a basketball game, and Tyrone is a basketball player. That's it. He's not a magic basketball player, he's not a famous basketball player, he's just some guy who's pretty good at basketball. That's his special power. Okay, what else? Quirk. This was actually a Game Boy Puzzle Maze title originally made by Atlas of Japan. Quirk is a tomato, and he gets angry if you pronounce that tomato. That is the extent of his character and his role in the show. And finally, Bigfoot. A monster truck, because monster truck racing had attained brief mainstream popularity in the mid to late 1980s and someone turned it into a pretty good NES game. But yeah, there's your heroes. A barbarian, a narcotics officer, a basketball player, a tomato, and a truck. Together, they battle Mr. Big, the bad guy from NARC, as the power team. You know what? There's nothing else that needs saying. Here's a taste. to agree with Tyrone. I'd hate my archenemy, the evil wizard Malkiel, to see me like this. He's gonna use his lasers, Bigfoot! Go to hyperdrive! You got it, Johnny! You're not getting anyone, Joe! It's really not proper operational procedure for Quirk to go off on his own. He was angry about what Mr. Big was doing with the tomatoes. He took it personally. Make it have the stinking tomatoes! 
But Bob, Power Team? I thought it was called Video Power. Well, that's where this gets weirder. See, the Power Team cartoon was actually supposed to be the centerpiece of a game-based kiddie variety show. That was Video Power. The 15-minute cartoon would come on in the middle of each episode, bookended by live-action segments featuring actor Stevie Bukowski as the quote-unquote real Johnny Arcade. How'd you like my boy Quirk? Not bad for a vegetable. Okay. Johnny Arcade was something else. He didn't just host the cartoon, oh no, he also reviewed games. The object is to work your way from the inner city wasteland all the way out to the woods where the Shadow Boss has his headquarters. A big difference between the NES Double Dragon and this version is that on Game Boy you start out with full power. And gave you gaming tips. In stage 5-2, go for the one-up behind the lower globe. But watch how Ryu glides from one edge to another. And generally just kind of goofed around in somebody's idea of what kids would think was a really, really cool house. But you know what? Lame as the power team were and dorky as this whole production is, going back to watch it, the innocent, oh boy, video games enthusiasm is sort of charming. You know what's not charming? The show's second season. I'll warn you, things are about to get very 90s in here. My show is kicking with maximum height. Say video power. Yeah, that's right. Word. Yeah, for whatever reason, the producers decided to junk the power team and retool video power completely into a game show, a la better-known series like Starcade and Nick Arcade. Johnny was regulated to the role of omniscient mascot figure, while most of the hosting duties fell on Terry Lee Torok. And boy, was this hard to watch. And you, right to April's Loft and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2. Now, what are four guys doing in April's Loft? Well, we're about to find out. Video Power went off the air around 1992 or so to comparatively little fanfare. The Power Team cartoons were re-syndicated independently here and there on cable years later, but not widely, and there's been no DVD releases. Because if there had been, I'd probably own them. As for the erstwhile Johnny Arcade, Stiffy Pekoski is still working steadily as a character actor, making multiple Law & Order appearances and gaining some overdue grown-up notoriety as McGonagall on Brotherhood. And yeah, folks, that was Video Power and the Power Team. I'm Bob, and I can't forget this stuff, so now you don't get to either. Yes, there's a Sonic the Hedgehog movie in theaters now, which means it's once again time for us to revisit this absurd tradition of looking back over the mostly sorry tradition of video game movies and hoping to pick out the good ones. Except it's now been long enough that there's actually enough decent ones so we don't have to cheat and say things like, well, can we pretend that only the Mark Dacascos parts of Double Dragon count? I mean, like, still not a lot of decent ones, but more. <laughs> So this literally just snuck out on US Netflix like seven or eight hours ago after a run in Japan last year that engendered some controversy for spending a bucket load of CGI animation money on rendering fully realized Dragon Quest imagery based on all the original Akira Toriyama iconic design for creatures and armor and characters and everything, but shifting the art style just enough so it's not a direct translation and more like a halfway point between the default Pixar, Overwatch, Blizzard, Universal 3D look with Toriyama proportions. It still looks pretty unmistakably Dragon Quest to me, but if you're watching it to see Dragon Quest stuff crash around looking prettier than it ever has with that iconic orchestral music, you definitely get more than enough of that. As for whether or not it's any good, well, it's kind of fascinatingly awkward art piece, honestly, attempting to literally adapt one of the most convoluted and densely plotted games in the series, Dragon Quest V, into a clean, linear narrative that's both earnestly sincere and also playing the exaggerated fantasy tropes for self-aware comedy and also... Look, you should really just watch it for yourself. I'm not sure where they go with this works, but I respect the hell out of them for trying. Yeah, if you watch it, you'll see what I mean. The first Resident Evil was bad, the second one is also bad, but they kind of started to have more fun with it. The third one is easily the best of the franchise, and then the rest overall kind of add up to not all that bad set of action films all told, especially when you lay out how bad some of the games eventually get on the narrative side, but Extinction is still definitely the best. It's the best directed, has the cleanest action, the best use overall of Miliovich's consistently substantive action chops. Don't pretend you're not looking forward to seeing what she does with that Monster Hunter movie. <laughs> You wouldn't think a dozen or so people who are good at fighting have a contest to see who's the most good at it is that complicated a premise to work out a story of, but Capcom will keep trying to prove you wrong. Even still, dozens of attempts later, the 1994 unrated VHS that introduced an entire generation to the idea that there was something extra about animated movies from Japan is probably the closest to coherent anyone has ever come to knocking out a real story from Street Fighter's cartoon slugfest. And even today, after several attempts, it still has the right mix of timeless arcade cheese and crunchy 90s anime grit to really pack a punch. 
The DOA movie is effectively a time capsule of early 2000s music video and action movie aesthetics that junks about 90% of the franchise's plot, but kept about 80% of its visual appeal and draped the whole remainder over an admittedly economical action comedy premise. The fighters are guests at a luxury island resort where at any moment they can be randomly signaled to begin a one-on-one -on -one match. It's dumb and silly, but the action is very well staged. The cast is fun and seems to be mostly having a good time, and believe it or not, Kevin Nash and Jamie Presley as Bassentina are giving probably two of the most authentic game-to-screen performances on this whole list. And also, Eric Roberts is in this. So, it's got that. I mean, none of the other movies on this list have Eric Roberts. <laughs> Unreleased outside Japan, for reasons I'm not entirely clear of, the Animal Crossing anime offers all the soothing hypnotic mellow of watching someone play Animal Crossing. That's pretty much it. There isn't much more to it than that. It's a cute kitty anime, all your faves from the game are there, doing their thing. If you like Animal Crossing, it's basically a mild ecstasy hit. <laughs> I understand some folks are still pretty divided on this one, but as far as I'm concerned, what a prop off Silent Hill movie had to do was recreate the feeling of being in Silent Hill, the desperation of knowing what was going to happen when the transitions hit, the panic of not understanding what was going on with your surroundings, and the abject horror of being surrounded by all of this abject horror. Also, Pyramid Head should probably show up and just fuck a whole bunch of shit right the hell up, and he does. I got that, it looks spectacular, there's a great bad guy turn by Alice Kurji, it's got a great cast otherwise, go back and watch it, this holds up. <laughs> Okay, so I wanted to do a joke here where we literally just played the Mortal Kombat theme music, but that's a copyright strike on YouTube, so whatever. Look, the first Mortal Kombat basically holds up. Yeah, it sucks that they couldn't do the fatalities in a PG-13, but they got the look right. The fights are good, the casting mostly worked out. Sub-Zero, Scorpion, Kano, Goro were especially terrific. Kari Hiroyuki Tagawa was so good at Shang Tsung, they put him in the games. Especially at the time, this was about as good as anyone was doing. The great Takashi Miike, who also did a really solid Yakuza movie that almost makes this list, brought a one-to-one -one riff on Phoenix right to life in live action, basically because he could and we're all better off for it. Miki has worked in literally every genre of Japanese entertainment, and then some, and his often hyper-literal adaptations of anime, manga, and video games can be difficult to parse. You know, is he poking fun at the unreal awkwardness of the material by staging it so literally, or preserving it as respectful art object in his own right? Given that he sometimes makes as many as four of these films a year, I tend to think the puzzled reaction of the audience is Miki's real media, and the films are just the means by which he gets there. Either way, the Ace Attorney movie is just a riot. Check this out if you haven't. <laughs> How cute was this, right? You got to see Pokemon running around, being all adorable in a sort of reality. You got a pretty solid sort of Blade Runner-esque neo-noir detective story with the kid and the talking Pikachu. The whole central mystery with Mewtwo and the missing people and what was actually going on was just exactly strange enough and the big climax was excessively cool. They even found a way to make Ditto interesting. I mean, this was great. <laughs> Alright, now just hear me out. It's a pure, honest translation of the premise of the game to the screen. It's an absolutely solid monster movie in its own right, and lest you forget, the actual premise of this film, released to theaters, is that a mad science company makes a chemical called Project Rampage, which turns regular animals into giant monster animals, and the giant monkey, giant wolf, and giant crocodile resulting from this attack Chicago. But when the army tries to blow them all up, the rock is there and says, no, that giant monkey is my best friend, and I can use sign language to make him good again, and he'll help us fight the other monsters. I mean, do I need to say anything else? No. No, I don't think so. I'm Bob, and that's the big picture. Look, I know I did a Games Into Movies episode last time as well, but we're still a couple of weeks out from PAX East and GDC, and we've actually gone a couple of days without some game company showing its ass in public by some miracle, so there really isn't anything new to chew on news-wise. I mean, unless you want me to talk about stuff we only have vaguely pending details to come announcements about, like Labo VR or Google's supposed streaming console or whatnot, and I don't really have anything to say about either of those other than, of these two, questionably timed, ostentatious-sounding reboots of dubious ideas that people didn't want the first time, I bet one of them will be kind of fun and not just an expensive planned obsolescence data harvesting lure for early adopters like Glass was. I mean, besides, we're finally at the point where this is going to stop being a tiresome hypothetical discussion because Games to Movie Wave finally seems to be building to something ever since the first trailers started dropping for Detective Pikachu and the entertainment industry watchers realized, oh, right, that thing is going to make a billion goddamn dollars even if it's not any good, and it looks pretty damn good. Plus, you've got the Minions people doing the new Mario movie, which I'm really trying to keep an open mind about, and we're apparently staring down the barrel of the Sonic trailer releasing any day now, which I'm sure everyone is <clears throat> 
excited about. So yeah, we're probably going to end up with a bunch of game movies now, but like now based on stuff that's actually endured and has some broader time proven pop culture cachet as opposed to, hey, that Assassin's Creed thing sure is popular right at this minute. That might be worth wasting a year of Michael Fassbender's time on. Now I'm not 100% sure that Rampage necessarily qualifies as the same level of household name video game even to my generation as some other, but I do think that the movie version provides a decent template for how that kind of thing can work even in weird circumstances, and not only because I regard it as the only actual great video game movie, as in I thought it was a legitimately awesome giant monster movie, not just I think it makes legitimately smart decisions about how you turn this kind of thing into a film. You see, the question you gotta ask yourself with anything like this is, what do people remember about a game and what will they get a charge out of seeing on screen? And as source material, Rampage the Game had kind of the same problem that a lot of bigger modern games have, in that it was already trying to look and feel like the playable, sillier version of things that were already kind of bad movies. So they had to do it a little different, but also keep a lot of the game stuff. So they zeroed in on the giant monsters climbing and knocking down skyscrapers, because that is the game, and that there were three specific monsters with names, went with big animals instead of humanoid type ones to keep it different. You know, having the most charismatic movie star on the planet doing a kind of meta in the movie player character thing as the guy helping the good monster fight the bad ones didn't hurt either, I imagine. Increased strength, George! speed, agility. No! George, you okay? Ready to do this, buddy? And then they plugged other decently done monster movie stuff in around it. And they even worked in that thing from the game where you eat the girl in the red dress for the most points. Awesome. See, I don't buy that the thing you lose taking a game out of the context of being a game is the interactivity. It's the feeling that your response to that interactivity engendered, separate from the feelings that were responding to the narrative, characters, whatever else. So the successful game adaptation is likely the one that finds a way to approximate that sensation. Like I've seen those Detective Pikachu trailers play to audiences in theaters, and every time you can't even hear the sound over all the kids in the place just pointing and shouting out the names when they see their favorite Pokemon. So the movie plays the same way, thus recreating a version of the oh boy, I saw and or caught up whatever fans used to get out of the game, then it's probably going to connect with people and be a hit. And if the Mario movie gives any of the 30 plus years worth of people who've got great memories of playing those games some semblance of connection to those, that might work too. Or if maybe the next person to take a pass at Street Fighter remembers that people play Street Fighter in the format of a fighting contest, and that the games are about a fighting contest, and that fighting contests are a really good thing to make movies out of, because like, there's a lot of really great popular movies that people like about fighting contests. It's one of the most proven subgenres. I, I mean, I mean, look at that's still going. There's a lot of good movies in there. A couple of them won Oscars for Stallone. But then every time they make a Street Fighter movie, it's all about like war or something. It's cool. Anyway, that's what every other game movie adaptation can learn from Rampage. 